The emptiness of a monochromatic frame can say so much. A grand expanse of nothingness from a gleaming white introduction, and there's already a tremendous amount we know about Fargo. Before anything has been said, the Coen brothers have made a statement, opting to aesthetically reduce their 1996 film to its absolute minimum. And this unapologetic starkness isn't merely a motif, it's a way of being in Fargo. From the lyricism of its barren landscapes, to a conversational vacancy. She heard about the homicides down here and thought I should call it in, so I called it in. End of story. In a filmography wedged between the Hudsucker Proxy and the Big Lebowski, Fargo's anti-cinematic essence bleeds from its bleak paws. In a story where indifference becomes the source of our entertainment, complexity emerged through the simplicity. But how do you make that which is intentionally uninteresting, interesting? You see something down there, Chief? No, I just think I'm gonna barf! In an attempt to capture this lethargic ambience, Fargo's original storyboarding process only included the use of static shots, an approach which was logistically unachievable. Yet this method gives us an insight as to how the inertia of this story would impact its cinematic techniques. If everything was planned to be told without any movement, then the only narrative tools the camera can utilise is what's inside the image. Roger Deakins, as the cinematographer for Fargo, once said that framing was the most important aspect of what he does, and that couldn't be more important than in this film. Because Fargo's self-imposed limitations means that everything we need to know about the relationships of these characters is told through the framing and staging of each scene. I guess you think you're, uh, you know, like an authority figure? That stupid fucking uniform, huh, buddy? King clip on tie there, big fucking man, huh? Most of a character's role can be revealed oh, in how they take up the space of an image. If they have nothing to add, they might be brushed aside. Who's in pajamas, Walter? Shut the fuck up, Danny. And if they fill us with uncertainty, they may dominate the frame. How important a character is in composition can tell us how important they are to the events at hand. And it's no surprise for the Coens to use framing to such a precise degree. They're known for their proficiency to the smallest details. Where is Pancake's house? Well, it's gotta be Pancake house. And then, when we're doing the scene, I say, where's the Pancake house? And Ethan? Peter? Yeah. What were you saying there? Where's the Pancake house? No, it says Pancake's house. Oh, I thought it was a typo. No, no, there's no typos in our scripts. Everything is deliberate. Each frame is a meticulously planned example of how to show a character's relations to the world and people like, around them. So and it's the feelings that. within a character that dictates how they're framed. Here we get a sense that Jerry is becoming trapped by his failing plan because of how the camera pictures the prison-like blinds in his diminishing world. Yeah, but the deal's already done. I already got the money. Yes. Yeah, well, they exist, all right. <laughs> Emotion isn't just what's inside a scene, but how the camera depicts it. We can show that a character is melancholic through his actions, but the camera is able to visualise this so much more. For instance, this shot seems to show Jerry as a lonely loser character, but being shot from a distance on a telephoto lens makes it feel that much more solemn. Uh, uh, yeah, Wade Gustafson, please. Framing is character, and with less than nine minutes of shared screen time, the tender implications displayed between the characters Marge and Norm make them the greatest contrast to all the other subjects of the film, with the cinematography stressing this fact. I'll fix you some eggs. In their first scene eating together, both Marge and Norm are framed in a two shot, a simple choice that pictures them as equals. This is quite standard. Yet as Marge leaves the house, the camera remains in the same position and waits for her re-entrance, framed so that they never leave each other's side. Hi. Yeah? Growler needs a jump. Comparatively, Jerry's first dinner with his wife shows her out of focus and in the background before disappearing completely. Jerry has no particular regard for her. She's just as easily disposable in his world as in ours. And this ongoing apathy is reflected by most characters through the framing. Whereas Marge and Norm are shot side by side, other subjects display a separation, 
They're instead shot in singles rather than being shot together. <laughs> you should see the other guy. <laughs> There's something so picturesque about the fact that no matter what Marge and Norm do, they're inseparable. We don't see one without the other. All their scenes are two shots, adding a level of unspoken romance between both, especially seeing how distinct this is to everybody else. Shooting in singles can create a tension and division between two subjects. The two people have to be connected by cuts, and it can establish a disconnect. Would it kill you to say something? I did. No. It's the first thing you've said in the last four hours. That's a, that's a fountain of conversation, man. But being framed together adds more intimacy. Think of the blocking in this scene. It makes no sense that Norm wouldn't acknowledge the police officer, but instead it shows that he prioritises sharing the same space as his wife, almost looking directly at her. Framing in a two shot can act as a silent indicator for us to directly relate one subject with the other. And if the aim is to associate two subjects, then the framing is what displays that relationship. Do we want them to oppose one another, or have a shared warmth? This can all be told in the framing, because to share the image, evokes a connection yeah. saved only for those deserving of it. I was married, uh, I, I was married to, you mind if I sit over here? Uh, I was married to Linda Cooksey. No, why don't you sit over there, I prefer that. Huh? Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> As for the rest of Fargo, most of it is shot very simply, using over the shoulders with standard shot reverse shot. As is typical of Roger Deakins, he foregoes the more ostentatious camera work of his peers and tries to say more by doing less. You know, a lot of the time, a lot of times, um, filmmakers get too involved in in showing off with a camera, but it's really about characters and uh, performance and atmosphere. You know? We wanted to make it much more observational. The camera work is much more restrained, really. There's not a lot of kind of fast tracks and, 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 and flowery sort of uh, camera work and camera moves. It's, it's much more observational, much more restrained. And as most of this film is just scenes of people talking, what else can framing do to add depth? Dialogue framing is dependent on two things, the position of the camera and the staging of the subjects. Altering either of these things changes the framing and thus the emotion of the scene. We can feel completely different things about a character based on how they're displayed. First off, there are one-on-one -on -one encounters. It may seem limiting as to how conversations like this can be presented, but managing the position of both actors and the camera is where the creativity lies. In the scenes between Jerry and another subject, the dialogue is sparse, but what emphasizes the relationships more than words is the staging and framing. The characters that Jerry addresses almost never look at him. He's either staged behind them you going to the Gophers on Sunday? Oh, you betcha. Completely out of frame. Dan? Yeah. It's Dan Grossman call. Yeah, okay. What? Okay. Or just out of the line of sight. I haven't been able to get him, so I thought maybe you'd know an alternate number. I would have you. Nope. Okay. Well, oh, look at them. Staging can signify the dynamics between subjects. And rather than being addressed properly, we're shown just how seriously people take Jerry. He's hardly even part of a two-way conversation. In this scene, the two shot could have been both characters facing one another, or have Wade turn around and shoot it in shot reverse shot singles. However, the camera's positioning puts Jerry in the background, getting absolutely zero attention in the frame. But even when Jerry's staged in a normal, friendly conversation, it's the positioning of the camera which tells us about his internal conflict. For instance, in the interview scene, Marge is framed from an over-the-shoulder shot of Jerry, so she's never really isolated in the frame, whereas Jerry is shot in a single. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not arguing here. I'm cooperating, and there's no, we're doing all we can. He feels alone. How we depict subjects in conversation gives us the extra depth to the character beyond what they say, and other staging patterns emerge when there are more subjects talking at once. Think of these patterns as invisible lines between the subjects, and what shapes can be created can infer what emotion is attempted to be conveyed. For Jerry, he's often pinned down in conversation with two subjects acting together to overpower him, like a triangle. 
a fucking liar. For example, when Jerry talks with both Wade and his aide, it's often staged so that Jerry is made insignificant by the men by being in the middle of them both. Where's my guarantee they're gonna let her go? Well, they- Million dollars, a lot of damn money. Yeah, but they- There they are, they got my daughter. He's surrounded by a threat by always having them on either side of him. And again, using the position of the camera to tell a story, we see at the beginning of this scene, when Jerry believes things are going his way, he shares the frame with Wade. But when things go sour, it shifts again to Jerry in a single, and instead Wade shares the frame with his assistant. Jerry, we thought you were bringing us an investment. Yeah, right. You're saying, what are you saying? You're saying we put in all the money and you collect when it pays off. <laughs> Where a filmmaker chooses to place the camera is a big decision. And typically the Coens like to have the camera inside the circle of action, the area that all the action of a single scene takes place. Having the camera inside the circle means that the action is unfolding all around the camera, such as putting it between two subjects talking. So you think you might remember who those folks were who called you? Or it can be outside of the action to hold a more objective view. And what we find with Jerry is that we often begin in yeah. the circle of action with him, feeling a sense yeah. of claustrophobic pressure. Yeah. But by the end, we watch him from outside the circle, moving back to a helpless vantage point. And this is a good way to summarize Fargo. A film which places us right in the middle of its story, but whose intention is only to show us the facts. We aren't there in this universe, its events are merely exhibited to us. Joel Cohen once commented that he felt Fargo was the least theatrical of his and his brother's work, but the unexpected depth that simplification can bring meant Fargo managed to create a unique sense of identity. In fact, it takes things to the fundamentals of filmmaking. What's in the frame and what does that say? Because words can only tell us so much, but images can live forever. I love you, Margie. I love you, Norm.